Bow your head with me, please. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, my God and Father, unto thee, Lord, I look, and we, your body, Lord Jesus Christ, Father, the Church of the Living God, we look unto thee. Thy will be done, Lord. Lord, um, may it be your will to bless the brethren in what you have called them unto. Lord, your will be done in their lives. Um, your will be done in whatever it is that you have called them to do. And may we, the Church of the Living God, the Body of Christ, bend our knees unto thy will, O Lord. And Lord, if this is your will that um, this video be done, please take me out of the way. Um, please, please, Lord, if it be your will, may, we, may you speak to this congregation through I, a sinner who is chief. And uh, may your words speak, Lord, not mine. And Lord, may I have um, be given wisdom, understanding, and knowledge to be used of you. And um, may your blessing be upon this, if it is your will, Lord. I repent, Lord. We repent, Lord. In Jesus' name, God's people said, Amen. Hi. Get your authorized uh, version, the King James Scriptures, the true scriptures. Uh, what, Brad, you're not saying Bible anymore? No. No, I'm, um, you know, um, my brother and I have talked about this. I mentioned this in the last video, and it's been a very big thing of conviction for me. And some of you might say, well, what about Biblos? Book. You know, book is in the Bible. Biblos. This is a personal thing for me. And uh, as many as the brethren have pointed out, um, I believe that we should, uh, our speech should be in accordance to the scriptures, the King James scriptures, the true, the real scriptures. This video, brethren, sisters, is going to be pretty much a scripture study. Okay? Pretty much. So, like I said, get your King James scriptures, the authorized version of the scriptures, the true and real scriptures. We are going to be studying a portion of scripture in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 21. But we're going to divert into little rabbit trails <laughs> here and there and uh, look at some corresponding scriptures, okay? Now, Turn in your King James Scriptures, the true and real Scriptures, to Acts 21, okay? But before we begin this, very quickly, I want to put this into your head. Paul, Paul, our Apostle, the Apostle unto the Gentiles, um, the example for all of us today, in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles. Um, we know that Paul hardly was never compromised his stands on the gospel and his um, doctrines. Never. Never. And we're going to look at that. But were there maybe some incidences within his life that we have here in Scripture where he did some things that maybe he shouldn't have done in order to make some people happy. Oh, Brad, shh. let's look at this, okay? Follow me along in the scriptures. 
The authorized version, the King James Scriptures, the true and real scriptures. Follow me along, okay? Get the get, get the scriptures. Don't just sit there. Follow me along in the scriptures that we will be reading today. Okay? Got it? Okay. Acts chapter 21. We will be reading verses 18 on to verse 30. I, I got eight notes. Okay? 18 on to verse 30. Now, backstory. Paul goes to Jerusalem. Okay? You can read the context from verses 1 on to verse 18 on your own time. Paul goes to Jerusalem. The Holy Ghost warns Paul about going to Jerusalem. And it is strongly believed, and I believe it also myself, that the Holy Ghost probably did not want Paul to go to Jerusalem at this time. That the Holy Ghost, you know, and the Lord is that Spirit, our Lord and Father, Jesus Christ, okay? You could argue that the Lord had another, had maybe another means for him to get there, and he probably did not want him to go to Jerusalem at this time. Because of the warnings that you see here, okay? Before we get to uh, verse 18. And you can note, especially verse 13 and 14, where we see a little bit of Paul's pride getting into the thing. And Paul struggled with pride, brethren. That was Paul's sin, I believe. And I, I believe that's very provable and documentable here in the scriptures, where he's talked about how he had the thorn in the flesh, lest he be exalted above measure because of the revelation. Or the revelations, right? Right? And you uh, read Romans chapter 7. Okay? And you see, you read this from verses 1 on to verse 18 on your own time. Here in Acts chapter 21. Paul struggled with pride. Okay? But Paul goes to Jerusalem. I believe against the better wishes of our Lord. Even though our Lord used that to get him to Rome. I believe, again, that probably the Lord wanted Paul to go a different way. Doesn't that sound kind of familiar to some of you, huh? The Lord will have you to go, will have something in store for you, but you decide to do it your own way instead of the way that he would gradually have you to go, and you pay a consequence for it, even though you get there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, enough. Acts chapter 18 on to verse 30. We begin. And the day following, Paul went in with us on to James. James. And all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which, which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Stop right there. Stop right there, okay? Two things I want us to note here. In verse 18, James, okay? This is not the brother of James because we are uh, the brother of John because we know earlier in the book of Acts that James, the brother of John, got decapitated, okay? So this is another James, I believe, okay? Not the brother of John. The sons of uh, the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee. Okay, this is another James, I believe. But James, okay, remember that because we're going to look at this in verse twenty again. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. 
and they are all zealous of the law. Verse 21. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Note that. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Verse 23. Do this, do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. That's going to come into play later. Them take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads, that's going to come into play later too, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself walkest orderly and keepest the law. Oh boy. Oh boy. Let's continue. As touching the Gentiles, which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, and from blood, and from strangled, and from fornication. Now, let's look at something about this James, okay? Now, before we do that, note these things. First, James, note that, and in verse 20, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Okay, verse 22. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. And verse 24. Them take, and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Now there are several things here to note. Okay? In verse 24 here, purify thyself with them and be at charges with them. Okay? And also in verse 23 that they had a vow. Okay? And that they were zealous for the law. Go to Acts 15 now. About James. Acts 15. We're going to be reading verses 13 on to verse 20. Okay? Acts 15 verses 30 on to verse 20. 13 on to verse 20. Beg your pardon. Okay? Beg your pardon. And after they had held their peace, James answering answered, saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, it's James, not Pope Peter? <laughs> Beg your pardon. Okay, continue. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Shemaian hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. That right there is a reference to Amos chapter 9. You go find that on your own time, okay? Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from the Gentiles, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. 
but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. Okay? And then uh, when you continue reading this, okay, after the, this is the Jerusalem conference, okay? Because of this, after this, everybody was preaching what Paul preached. How that Christ Jesus died for our sins uh, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay? And that anyone can get saved to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Okay? Okay? But notice something here. James was what? A Jew. Okay? He was a Jew. Notice, and this is something that you might run into with the um, those who want to bring people back under the law to say that you have to keep the law in order to stay saved. Okay? Notice something here. Look at verse 20. Now, he's talking about the Gentiles here. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. Okay? Note that. Go to Galatians now, chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 under verse 21. Okay? Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 on to verse 21 to end that chapter. Go there, please. We begin. I have in the margin of my uh, scriptures here. <laughs> First Pope rebuked. <laughs> okay, let's continue. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Those Jews who believed, but yet believed that they had to keep the law. Okay? Let's continue. And, other, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So a lot of the Jews, when they saw the Jews that came from James, James was a saved, born-again, church of the living God, part of the body of Christ. Absolutely. 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 But, however, we are beginning to see something because he said that, oh, unto the Gentiles, we only expect this much of you. And here, when some of the brethren from James came, when Peter was amongst the Gentiles, okay, when these brethren came from James, he's like, oh boy, I gotta go, you know? Now, you got to remember, culturally, there is distinction, okay? There is. There is. And if you want to keep certain things, if you're Jewish watching this, if you want to do those things uh, for cultural reasons, fine. Knock yourself out. Go right ahead. But salvifically, salvifically, as pertaining to salvation, You don't need to keep the law. It's not a requirement. The, the Ten Commandments. You couldn't keep them even if you tried. Okay? There are commandments today for us as a Christian. Yes, there is. Yeah, excuse me. See, I messed up. There are command commandments for us today, the Church of the Living God. Beg your pardon. <laughs> oh, I, struggle with, uh, I struggle with that, okay? There are. But the law of Moses is not pertinent 
to our salvation. I've already covered that before. Okay, I might link that video in the description box, okay? But let's continue. Verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel. I said unto Pope Peter, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> I said unto Peter before them all. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Let's continue. We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if we, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. There, right, well, hold on. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 19 is also a very good verse to use to pointing out that Jesus Christ is God the Father, and that the uh, Holy Ghost, the Lord is that spirit. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. Okay? You are given the Holy Ghost once you are saved. Okay? Christ liveth in me. Verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law then Christ is dead in vain. This thing about James. Now, James was saved, born again, church of the living God, part of the body of Christ. Amen. When you and I get up there, brother, sister, we're going to see James. We're going to see James, both of them. The brother of John, the sons of Zebedee, and James here. Okay? But we have seen, okay, in Acts 21 and also in Acts 15 and right here in Galatians, I think there was something that James himself struggled with. The two bodies. Now, everyone was preaching what Paul preached after Acts 15. Yes, yes, okay. But see, you as a Jew, you do not have to keep the law of Moses to stay saved. You are not required to do that for salvation. Okay? Uh -uh. Like the dietary thing, not being mingled amongst the Gentiles, okay? That kind of stuff. That is not there in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles. Okay? I believe James struggled with the one way for the Jew and one way for the Gentile, even though there is one way for salvation. That they as Jews were obligated to keep the law of Moses. Well, us Gentiles, this here, this is all we expect of you. And we see here in Galatians, Paul absolutely refuting that. 
And the doctrines for us today in this dispensation come from Paul, right? Not your head. Yes. Okay. Now I'm not I'm not kicking James, not at all. But see, you will run into maybe um, some of the Messianic Jews out there who are our brothers or sisters in Christ, the Church of the Living God. You will see this type of mentality in some Jewish people who are truly saved and born again. Well, you know, you, you Gentiles, hey, that you know, you you don't got that much to do, but we we still got these things. No, 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 brethren, no, <clears throat> no, that is not the case. That is not the case. For there is neither Jew nor Greek. Where is that in here? Uh, this is uh, not part of my notes. Oh, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 and verse 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed seed and heirs according to the promise okay that is talking about salvation now culturally if you're a jew and you want to go ahead and keep the the law of moses go ahead but remember remember the keeping of the law the law of moses is not a requirement for salvation or to stay saved because once you are truly saved and born again by grace through faith you're sealed okay it's not your salvation to lose it's not your salvation to keep okay the Lord Jesus Christ our God and Father Father has you right there and no man's going to pluck you out of his hand. And you know what? That doesn't mean you're going to do a -hoo 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 jump out of his hand either. Okay? I believe that James struggled with that. I, again, I'm not kicking. I'm not kicking James at all. I'm just, I'm not saying. I'm just saying. See, James, we see evidence that he favored the, okay, yeah, we're all saved by grace through faith. Okay, yes, yes, we're all saved like that today in the time of the Gentiles. But us Jews, we got to keep this, and you Gentiles, you just do these. No, 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 no. Culturally, again, if you want to do that, and you're Jewish, you want to do that, knock yourself out. Go right ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's not pertinent for salvation. Not at all. Okay? That's something that I believe James struggled with. Paul struggled with pride. James struggled with the two-body thing. And like I said, those who are Judaizers, okay, those who want to bring you under the law, saying that you as a Gentile, you have to start speaking Yiddish, wear the little uh, yarmulke, okay, the kipper right there, okay? And you got to put the prayer shawl on, and you got to you gotta do the this, uh, which that is nowhere in Scripture, okay? Nowhere. But we are up. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. This is not talking about culture. Okay? Culture. Again, you won't, you're Jewish. You want to do that stuff? Have fun. Have fun storming the castle. Go. Do it. But you try to say you have to do it like this in order to stay saved. 
you have to become Jewish in order to be a part of the body of Christ or the Church of the Living God? It's not what Paul preached. And as we saw in Galatians 2, Paul preached against it. You understand? Okay? Now, let's go back now to Acts chapter 21. <clears throat> now, we read up to verse 25. Okay? So, we see that about James. And we saw also about how the Jews were zealous of the law, but yet they believed. They were our brothers and our sisters. Okay? Don't know if no, it says right here, these were our brothers. Okay? Part of the body of Christ. But yet they believed they still they were still zealous for the law. And we saw in Galatians for today, in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, that's not a requirement. Okay? It's not a requirement. But right here, in verse 22, about coming together and, verse 23, do, the, do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed, that and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Okay? Now, I had once said before that um, Galatians, uh, uh, in Galatians 1, that Galatians 1 and Acts 15 didn't mingle, okay? But they do, okay? They do. And I believe that Galatians was after the Jerusalem conference, okay? I do believe that. So, this is noteworthy, okay? Now, they had a vow, okay? Okay? And then he says here in verse 25, as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written we have written and concluded that they observe no such things. See right there. Right there. That okay. They believe like we do. We're we're all saved. But yet we we Jews we, we should be doing this while well, you Gentiles. And we just saw that Paul disputed that. Let's continue. Save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Now, check this out. Then Paul took the men. We're reading in verse 26 now. Then Paul took the men and the next day purifying himself with them entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. An offering, okay? An offering. Now these men had a vow. And also note in verse 24, them take and purify thyself with them, and bear charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Okay? And up at verse 23 again, we have four men which have a vow. Now, what was this vow? What was this vow? I believe that the four men had the vow of a Nazarite, okay? A Nazarite vow. Turn in your King James Scriptures now. You know what, brethren? I'm going to use my bookmark there. Turn in your King James Scriptures now to Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. Very interesting. 
when you do a word search in the King James scriptures, the real scriptures, of the word shave, okay, you'll notice that there's when uh, with like a woman or whatnot, they shave their head after a battle or something like that. But when it comes to a vowel in scripture, there was only one vowel that required shaving your head. There is only one vowel that required shaving the head. Okay, could someone have vowed to shave their head and have that part of their vow? Yes, they could. But the only vow that required shaving the head at, at any time was the Nazarite. Go to Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. <clears throat> Numbers chapter 6. I believe that the four men had a vow of the Nazarite. It does not say that in the book of Acts. But because it says here, and go back to Acts now, do this in verse 23 and 24, do therefore this that we say to thee, we have four men which have a vow on them. It doesn't say it was a Nazarite vow, okay? It does not say that. But it says, them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads. Okay? Now, Numbers chapter 6. We will be reading verses 1 on to verse 21. Okay? Go there in the King James Scriptures. Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 on to verse 21. We will not be reading the, the Aaronic blessing. Numbers chapter 6. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine, or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head, until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy, and shall let the locks of his hair, and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he is separate that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother. For his brother or for his sister when they die because the consecration of his God is upon his head all the days of his separation he is holy on to the Lord now we see right here the some of these requirements okay they're not to drink um, they shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink neither shall they neither shall oh, this is verse 3 Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dry. Okay, that's one. But, verse 6, All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. Now, did those four men in the book of Acts come by uh, near a dead body? We don't know. Did they drink something like that? We don't know. Okay, we don't know. But there again, a vow that required the shaving the head. And you search the scriptures yourself. Okay, there was only one vow that required. Okay, let's continue. Verse 9. And if any man die very suddenly by him, and he hath defiled the head of his consecration, 
Then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing, in the day of his cleansing, on the seventh day shall he shave it. And on the eighth day he shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering, okay, and the other for a burnt offering, and make an atonement for him, for that he sinned by the dead, and shall hollow his head that same day. Now, go back now, hold your place there, where I've been, we're at verse 12, hold your place here and go back now to Acts chapter 22. Okay? Now, it says in here in verse 24, shave their heads, and in verse 23 that they had a vow. Okay? Reading again from verse 26, Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And right here, okay, we're not going to read this whole verse yet, but just this part. And when the seven days were almost ended, in verse 27, don't read it on. Don't read that out of uh, out of place yet. Okay. Don't read that out of place yet. Okay. We see in verse twenty six that Paul took these guys and followed the Mosaic law or the law of Moses as far as purification. Okay. We see that because that's what verse twenty six does tells us. Okay. Now go back. Whoops. Now go back to Numbers chapter six, picking up at verse twelve. And he shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation, and shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering. But the days that were before shall be lost, because his separation was defiled. Let's continue. And this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he shall offer his offering unto the Lord. One he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, and one ram without blemish for peace offerings, and a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their meat offering, and their drink offerings. So we see here in the Nazarite thing here that, of course, offerings, sin offerings, the sacrificing of animals for blood, okay, sacrifices had to be made. That is very, very, very key. Remember that. Hold that in your head. Hinge that, okay? The offer sin offering, okay? Because... Look at verse 11, and the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering. Sin offering. Read the book of Leviticus sometime. You'll see about that, okay? Now let's continue. Uh, where were we? We were at verse 14. And he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, and one ram without blemish for peace offerings, and a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their meat offering and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord, and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. And he shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall, all, shall offer also his meat offering and his drink offering. And the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall take the hair of the head of his separation and put it in the fire, which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And the priest shall take the sodden shoulder of the ram, and one unleavened cake out of the basket, and one unleavened wafer, and shall put them upon the hands of the Nazarite, after the hair of his separation is shaven. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. 
This is holy for the priest, with the waved breast and heaved shoulder. And after that, and after that, the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite, who hath vowed and of his offering unto the Lord for his separation, beside that that his hand shall get, according to the vow which he vowed, so he must do after the law of his separation. Okay? Okay? Now, look back at verse 9 here. In here, in Numbers chapter 6. And if any man die very suddenly by him, and he hath defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day shall he shave it. Now, go back. Go back to Acts chapter 22. Now, we do not know, or Acts chapter 21, excuse me. We do not know when these Jews shaved their heads. But, going off the principle that this was for a Nazarite, offering because they had to shave their head because they had a vow okay 26 and 27 again in acts 21 then paul took the men and the next day purifying himself with them entering entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them Okay? Okay? Now, about this offering for vows, okay? We saw the one of a Nazarite. Go to Leviticus chapter 5, okay? Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5, verses 1 on to verse 13. Okay, Leviticus chapter 5. Mostly paying attention to verse 4. But we want the context here. Okay, we want the context here. Leviticus chapter 5, verses 1 on to verse 13. Okay. And if a soul sin, and hear the voice of swearing, and is a witness, whether he hath seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. And if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast, or a carcass of unclean cattle, or the carcass of unclean creeping things, or if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Or if he touch the uncleanness of man, whatsoever uncleanness it be, that a man shall be defiled with all, it and it be hid from him. When he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. Now watch this. Or if a soul, note the, the mention of soul there. Note the mention of soul there. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil, or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him, when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things, that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. Now right, watch this. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin, which he hath sinned a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. And if he be not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring for his trespass, which he hath committed, two turtle doves or two young pigeons unto the Lord, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Thank you, pardon. And he shall bring them unto the priest, who shall offer that which is for the sin offering first, and wring off his head from his neck, but shall not divide it asunder. And he shall sprinkle of the blood of the sin offering upon the side of the altar, 
and the rest of the blood shall be wrung out at the bottom of the altar. It is a sin offering. And he shall offer the second for a burnt offering, according to the manner. And the priest shall make an atonement for him, for him for his sin which he has sinned, and it shall be forgiven him. But if he be not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he that has sinned, then he that sinned shall bring for his offering the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. He shall put no oil upon it, neither shall he put any frankincense thereon, for it is a sin offering. Then shall he bring it to the priest, and the priest shall take his handful of it, even a memorial thereof, and burn it on the altar, according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. It is a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him as touching his sin, that he has sinned in one of these, and it shall be forgiven him. And the remnant shall be the priests as a meat offering. So see, any sins back there in the Old Testament, you had to sacrifice something, okay? Uh, offerings were not objects of belief. <laughs> I, I have a video debunking the faith alone from... Genesis onto Revelation lie. It's a lie. Okay, that's a lie. Okay, under the Old Testament in this dispensation, under the law, you sinned, you had to sacrifice an animal and spill bl uh, for the blood. Okay, that's you had to do that. But now look back at verse four. I know that was a little weighty there, but we wanted the whole sandwich on that. Verse four. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him, when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. And then you see what process they had to go through. Aren't you glad that today you live in the time of the Gentiles, this current dispensation, where it is by grace through faith? And that if you confess your sin, sins, that he is just um, just and merciful to forgive you your sins. I just paraphrased that and butchered that. Beg your pardon. Okay? But now, some will ask, some may uh, say about, you know, this thing about the bow and the shaving the head. What about Paul, really quickly? What about Paul? Paul, he shaved his head because he had a bow. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Go to Acts 18. Acts 18. Whoa. Acts 18. Whoa, Brad, come on. Come on. Acts 18, verse 18. Just one verse. If I can get there. Okay. Acts 18, 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centura, for he had a vow. Now, a brother and I had talked about this specific verse. Was this because he was a Nazarite? I at first said, yeah, but the truth is, we don't really know if his vow was over a uh, Nazarite. Now, the only vow that required shaving their head was the, the vow of the Nazarite, right? And if I'm not mistaken here, um, if there is a reference for this in this uh, set of scriptures, which there is not, uh, yeah, it does call, the reference does call for the Nazarite. Here, uh, the uh, reference, because this is a cross-reference, um, Cambridge. It says that it gives Numbers uh, 6, verse 18. Okay? We really don't know if Paul had a vow of a Nazarite. We really do not know. We really do not know. Okay? All it says is, having shorn his head in Sanchera, for he had a vow. 
Now, like we have just looked at, the only vow that required shaving the head was the law uh, was the one of a Nazarite. But there was a purification that had to be um, instilled first. Remember what we looked at in Numbers chapter 6? And looking in uh, Acts 21 and verse 24, Take them and purify thyself with them. Purify them. The, they had to purify themselves. Okay? And shave their head because they had a vow. Again, clearly, the guys here in Acts 21, okay, the four, what was it? The four brethren? Okay. We have four men which have a vow, okay? These four guys, I, I totally believe that they had the uh, Nazarite vow upon them. But when it comes to Paul here in Acts 18, verse 18, it just says, having shorn his head in Sanchera, for he had a vow. Okay? Now, the Nazarite vow is not applicable for us today. Because what was the Nazarite vow? A separation unto the Lord, right? And today, in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, you have the Lord Jesus Christ living in you. You are sealed until the day of redemption. You know how it says, where two or, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. That was said before the crucifixion, okay? That was said before the crucifixion, okay? You're saved, born again. You're sealed until the day of redemption. You have the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, living within you. The Holy Ghost, you know? And the Lord is that spirit. Okay? You have God within you. So you don't have to go <laughs> too far to have fellowship with the Lord. Okay? The separation onto the Lord as concerning the Nazarite is not applicable for us today in the time of the Gentiles, this dispensation, because we are sealed. Back then, in that dispensation under the law, the Holy Ghost could come, go, come, go, come, go. Eternal security was not there under the law. Again, I have a whole video debunking that stuff, okay? I am going to link that in this video, okay? We do not know if Paul had the vow of the Nazarite, because then again, you got to keep this in memory, brethren. We saw, as far as the law of the Nazarite, okay, a brother and I had discussed, well, did Paul maybe drink some wine, or did he eat something, some grapes or something? We discussed that, and we changed, uh, exchanged uh, opinions and views on the scriptures, and um, upon further looking upon this, I think it was about the dead body, you know, that you shaved your head. Also, your uh, stuff would be defiled if you drank any strong drink or anything like that. But if you touch the dead body or come near anyone dead, then you would be totally, your consecration would be totally messed up, so to say. Okay? Because think about this. Paul, you know, must have been around the dead quite often as an apostle. You know, and also, too, we saw that when the one guy fell out of the loft and then Paul brought him up, you know, and brought him back to life. OK, so the law of the Nazarite doesn't. It is not for us today. OK, it is not. It is not. But very quickly. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 23, as for here now in Acts 18, verse 18. Okay? Acts 18, verse 18, about how it just simply says that Paul had a vow. It says nothing about him purifying himself as it does in Acts chapter 21 of the four guys who went in and purified themselves. Okay? And the seven-day thing, very key, very key, but not yet. Wait for it. Wait for it. Okay, 
Deuteronomy chapter 23. Okay. We're going to read just a couple verses there. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 21 on to verse 23. Okay. This is about a vow. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 21 on to verse 23. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. Now pay attention to this. That which is gone out of thy lips, thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering. Now note the semicolon or semicomma, whatever that thing is there, okay? That which is gone out of thy lips, thou shalt keep and perform, semicolon, even a free will offering, okay? That, uh, uh, even a free will offering is not descriptive of what you are keeping or performing, okay? It's another thing. Let's continue. Even a free will offering, according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. And then go back to Acts 18, verse 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria. And with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sanchera, for he had a vow. And like I had said, a brother and I had gone over this very thing about Paul's vow here. I was uh, saying it was more, uh, it was a Nazarite vow. And even the cross reference here in this Cambridge uh, set of scriptures uh, gives the reference for number six, verse 18. Okay. But we have no mention of the purif purification, purifying, as we do in Acts chapter 21. But we looked at... Uh, Deuteronomy 20, uh, 23, verses 21 on to verse 23, to show you that maybe we do not know. And I leave that we're looking at this and you guys come up with your own stuff. And if you have any corresponding scriptures, put them down there. Okay. Maybe Paul said, hey, something like, hey, if, if I can go this long uh, without my feet getting blistered, you, you do like, okay, I'll shave my head. We don't know. I had with a beloved brother when we were discussing this the one time, I was more pushing towards the, yeah, it was a Nazarite. But since then, the only evidence is that he shaved his head because he had a vow. There's not one lick mention of purification for that vow. So, as far as we know, for the evidence right there in 1818, Paul could have just simply vowed something and it's like to fulfill it, I'll shave my head. Okay? Okay? Now, go back to Acts chapter 21. We're going to read verses 26 and on to... Verse 30, okay? On to verse 30 now. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification, which was not there in Paul's vow, until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Remember what we looked in, um, looked at in... Uh, Numbers chapter 6 about the offering and also about Leviticus as concerning someone who vowed. Okay, always followed with an offering. Verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. Paul. Okay? Paul. Today, in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, you don't do offerings. Okay? You don't. You don't do 
sin offerings, burnt offerings, heave offering, wave offering, because the Levitical priesthood today is not there. There is the priesthood of the believer, as it is said. We don't have to go to a Levitical priest for anything. We have the Lord within us. We can go directly to the Lord. Directly to the Lord. Okay? We, we get this, right? Okay? And also see, too, James, a brother, my brother in Christ, Church of the Living God. He struggled with, we, we looked at evidence, I believe he struggled with, let me preface that, I believe he struggled with the, you know, well, we're all saved, same way, yes, but we being Jews, we have this higher standard that we got to keep the law. You Gentiles go along there. Again, I'm not kicking them. We looked at evidence to suggest that. Okay? And Paul refuted it. Verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, at the end of the seven days, an offering had to be offered. And remember, these four men, okay, were of those in Acts 21, verse 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are zealous of the law. Go back now to Acts, or go, yeah, go back to Acts 21, verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. So an offering was not yet offered. Okay? And we looked in Numbers, and we looked at Leviticus. Okay? And we also looked in Deuteronomy. You vow something to the Lord, you, you got to pay it. Don't worry, we're going to be getting to Matthew and James about the vow, so wait for it. Okay? Just wait for it. Okay, don't get ahead of me. Okay? But an offering had to be made, and these Jews were zealous of the law. Okay? They were zealous of the law. And today, in this dispensation, you do not offer offerings for sin. You go right to the Lord. You don't do turtles or a he-goat or a lamb or anything like that, or a sodden shoulder. No. Why? Go to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. The book of Hebrews is very significant unto the Jewish people after the, um, after the body of Christ is caught up, the resurrection, and going into the time of Jacob's trouble, because they are going to realize, a lot of Jews will realize, Oh, boy. What them King James Bible-believing Church of the Living God people were saying, that was true. Oh, boy. And Hebrews breaks it down specifically for the Jewish people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Hebrews is specifically, especially Hebrews and James, but especially Hebrews, is especially for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Yes, there are things that cross dispensational lines that are applicable for us today in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles. Okay, okay, yes, there is. Yes, but this is for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why it's broken down like this. But, okay. Now, we saw that before an offering was made. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 on to verse 28. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 on to verse 28. To close out that chapter. Yeah, there's a lot of scripture. Hope you're doing, handling it. Hebrews 9, verse 8 to 28, to close out the chapter. The 
Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offerings, which in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Let's keep reading. I'll shut up. Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. What is that Reformation? But Christ. What is that Reformation? But Christ. Being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in Catholic once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if, and I got that circled, if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, this is when the New Testament begins. Whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, okay, could it have been Paul? Yes, it could have been Paul. But, okay, this is when the New Testament starts. Check this out. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Think about Moses before they went over into the um, land of Canaan. Both Aaron and Moses died in the wilderness before they uh, went into the promised land. Because they transgressed at the waters of Meribah. Because uh, Moses got done got angry and smote the rock twice when the Lord said, speak to the rock. He's, the first time he smote a rock, the first time he was told to smite the rock and water came out. The second time he's like, speak to the rock. Okay, a type of Christ in a way. Because Christ was smitten for us and out came out water, right? Out comes out life. After that, you speak to the rock. Get it? Isn't that interesting? Let's continue. Verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And, okay, note that semicolon. Okay, this is something different. And without shedding of blood is no remission of sin. Hold your place here. We've got to look at this. Leviticus 17. We've got to look at this. 
Okay. You got people out there who tell you that it's faith alone from Genesis on to Revelation. If you fall for that, you might be a novice or a babe. Okay. But if you walk with the Lord for any amount of time, and you fall for that, <laughs> Leviticus 17. Work with me, fingers. Come on. Leviticus 17, verse 11. Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Go back to Hebrews chapter 9, picking up at verse 22 again. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Semicolon. And all, and, oh, wait, wait, wait. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Excuse me. And without shedding of blood is no remission. If I put sin on that word earlier, beg your pardon, forgive me. Ugh, beg your pardon. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves, which with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, Catholic, <laughs> as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Uh, brethren, if you ever want to refute the Mass, here's a good place, okay? For then must he have, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And uh, let's see. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, on to verse 7. I did have written there on to verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 on verse 7. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Take away sins. Excuse me. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, and the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So, no more offering for sin, because Jesus Christ's blood, God's blood, paid for your sin. 
for my sin. Very quickly, this is not in my notes, but very quickly, 1 John on that. 1 John. First John chapter one verse nine. Oh wait, wait, wait. Uh, First John chapter one verses seven on to verse ten. Take your part. First John one verses seven on to verse ten. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word, lowercase w, is not in us. So, the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross is the payment for our sin. And it is by grace through faith that we are saved and we trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? We believe that He died for our sins according to the Scriptures and He was buried and rose again third day according to the Scriptures. And that if you will confess with your mouth, you know, call on the name of the Lord, yeah. Yeah. So we see, especially today, of course today, because the offering has been made, has been paid, the debt has been paid, because Jesus Christ paid it for you and for me, a sinner who is chief. And I trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just believe in him, a trust on him. How about you? Go back to Acts now. Now back to verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus, an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. So, before an offering could be offered, they took Paul out of there. Because we had seen that Paul um, had refuted that you have to keep the law in order to stay saved in Galatians. Okay? We have seen that. I believe, brethren, see, Paul was there for the purification of these guys, okay? I believe that the Lord interfered and allowed that to happen to Paul to get Paul out before he offered a sacrifice because you don't offer sacrifices for sin today. Because the debt has already been paid. Jesus Christ. Blood on the cross. And through his blood we have the remission of sins. Okay? I believe that the Lord interfered there and allowed that to happen to Paul. And took him out. Before an offering could be made. Because offerings, we do not offer offerings today for anything like that, brethren. We don't. And James, a saved brother, Church of the Living God, okay? I believe he had the 
Well, there's the one way for us Jews and one way for the Gentiles, okay? Before the seven days, before the offering was offered, the Lord got his apostle to the Gentiles. Paul, our example for us today in the time of the Gentiles' this dispensation, got him out of there before an offering could be made because an offering didn't need to be made. And now, again about the vows, okay? Very quickly, because I said that we were going to look at this. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. The Sermon on the Mount. Okay? Matthew chapter 5. Verses 33 on to verse 37. Okay? Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 and verse 37. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is, the, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. And very quickly, James chapter 5, verse 12. James chapter 5, verse 12. But above all, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Okay? I had to put that in there about the vow, because I said I was going to. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's a little out of place there, but. Okay? So. Sorry about that. I know that kind of broke the flow a little. Beg your pardon. The Lord interfered, I believe, and got Paul out of there before an offering could be offered. Now, I had mentioned earlier at the beginning of this video about was there anything that Paul might have gotten involved in that maybe he shouldn't have done? And I mentioned about how um, the Lord kind of warned him about going to Jerusalem that maybe the Lord had another way, but yet he went anyway. Okay, because Paul struggled with his pride. Okay. Paul went in and did this stuff. Because James, okay, <clears throat> James said, uh, asked them to, in verse 21, And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together. For they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly, and keepest the law. And before, in verse 27, and when the seven days were almost ended, it just so happened that these guys freaked out because they saw Paul and got him out of there before an offering could be made. And the whole thing was kaput. Yeah. Turn to Galatians again. Galatians chapter 6. Now, Paul never compromised his doctrinal stance. Never once. No, not even once. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Verses 14 on to verse 18. 
Paul never um, compromised in his doctrinal stance. Never once. No. No. Galatians 6, verses 14 on to verse 18. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Paul taught that circumcision wasn't necessary for salvation. As alluded to in Acts 21, that those that, that those Jews that were zealous of the law believed that in order to be saved and stay saved, they had to keep the law and be circumcised. Which I've also answered before in an, on another video. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Right here. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Paul never compromised his doctrinal stance. No, 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 no. Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 12 on to verse 19. Okay. Paul bared in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12 on to verse 19. And here's something that we both, you and me, brother, sister, this is something we both got to remember. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take on to you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand. Note the stand there. That, uh, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. <clears throat> stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Are you prepared? Above all, taking the helmet of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And right here, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, capital S, which is the Word of God. And that is a lowercase w, referring to the written word. The authorized version, the King James scriptures, the true scriptures. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in this spirit, capital S, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. There's a semicolon there, but. So we see what we have just looked at. Paul bears the, bears the marks of the Lord Jesus in his body, and we're being told to stand and how to stand. Okay? And also, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10 on to verse 17. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 10 on to verse 17. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, beg your pardon, verse 10 on to verse 17. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. And hello, let's remember this one. 
Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child he was brought up. Timothy was brought up in the scriptures. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul said to Timothy, let no man despise your youth, because from a child he was brought up in the scriptures. Okay? Get it? Okay. And of course, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay? So we have thus far looked at Paul, when it came to doctrinal manners and the way he lived and stuff like that, his stands, he never, ever once compromised. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 6 and 8. 6 through 8, excuse me. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Paul kept the faith. He walked his talk. Oh, most definitely. First Corinthians... 15, verse 58. Okay, we're looking at these to see that Paul, when it comes especially to doctrine and the manner of life and stuff like that, he never compromised. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong, watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Amen. Be strong. Be strong. But now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're almost done. We're almost done. Like I said, in Acts 21, before an offering was made, I believe the Lord intervened. It's like, got him out of there. It was pretty painful. But then again, the Lord warned him in Acts 21. And like, hey, Paul, maybe you, you know, affliction is going to be there for you. Maybe you shouldn't go to Jerusalem just yet. Maybe not this way. Then Paul says, like, why are you breaking my heart? I am ready to die for Christ. And of course he was, because he was not a compromiser. But, but, I might have overdone something. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 1 on to verse 23. First Corinthians 9. Verses 1 on to verse 23. We're almost done. Am I not an apostle? 
Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Okay. Or I only am Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Full-time ministry. Also, you uh, read in the book of Acts about how the apostles said it wasn't meet for them to serve tables, but that they could uh, put themselves to preaching and teaching. I just paraphrase that. Okay. But right there, verse 6. Or I only a Barnabas have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare at who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses. Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen, or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. This is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? I know a lot of you have, uh, not a lot of you, but I know a lot of people out there, those who are my enemies, and those of enemies of brothers, such as Brian Denlinger and whatnot, they have a lot of problems with what is called a paid ministry. And they say, Paul didn't, Paul worked. But we see here in verse 6, have not we power to forbear working? Let's continue, okay? Verse 12, if others be partakers of this power over you, are we not, are not we rather? For those of you who dispute, who always get on Brother Brian, especially about how he doesn't work and whatnot, uh, I know there are, I, mean, I don't want to even say these people's names anymore, but uh, I know there are several out there who that day, harp on that. Right? He doesn't work. He doesn't work. He's lazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, verse 12 again. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power. Nevertheless, we have not used this power. But suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. They had the power to, but they chose not to, lest they hinder the gospel of Christ. Especially at this time. You know, when Paul came to these people in Corinth, you know, and plus, the Corinthians were having all kinds of issues. All kinds of issues. And at this time, being a, an apostle, setting the groundwork, okay, Paul thought it important to give them an example, even though in verse 6 he had power to forbear working. Let's continue. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel, not off the gospel, of 
the gospel. Of the gospel. Verse 15. But I have used none of these things. Paul chose not to. Paul had every right to forbear working and just concentrate all his time and effort preaching the word. But he chose not to. Brother Brian Denlinger, his job is preaching. He has a wife and a son to take care of. Okay? And, you know, him living off grid and having to man, uh, cut his own firewood and do all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Brother Brian Denlinger's job is to preach the word onto you. If you want to pay him, that's up to you. Okay? Of course. Nobody's obligated. He doesn't make it obli uh, an obligation for anyone to pay him. You know? Okay? If you want to give to a minister or ministry or to someone, that's up to you. You are not obligated to do so. Like the hirelings in the church buildings tell you. For God loveth the cheerful giver. But Paul chose not to take any of these things so he could set an example. Especially keeping in mind, brethren, that Paul was a single man, had only his own necessities to take care of, and at this time, especially at this time, with the church of Corinth, that had all kinds of issues, Okay, he had to set a proper example for these people. Let's continue. Verse 15 again. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that I should be, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory void. That I, I have power to do that, but I'm not going to. Remember, Paul was single, and remember the time at, of this when, when this was going on, okay? The gospel was first being brought out by Paul. The Lord was bringing it out through Paul, that part, okay? Got to keep that in mind, especially when you got people who you know, harp on other people for uh, if the brethren give them donations and stuff like that, okay? But he chose not to do that. For though I preach the gospel, now right here, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Now, right here. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Servant unto all. Paul went ahead with those four Jews who had a vow on them, and went in there with them, and uh, was with them in the purification. And unless the Lord had intervened, would have been there for a sacrifice before the seven days were ended. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I, may, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Right there. That verse right there. Okay. Like I said. Okay. Hold your place there. Go back to Acts chapter 21. Verse 22. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together. For they will hear that thou art come. 
Do this, do therefore this that we say to thee. And he went with them. For the multitude must needs come together. Verse 20 in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew. I have that circle. That I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law. That I might gain them that are under the law. And then look what happens after the Lord, I believe, intervened and got Paul out of there before the sacrifice was made. He got the chance to give his testimony and preach Jesus. Which a lot of them like said, away with such a man, away with him, and they cast dust up in the air and whatnot. Okay? But after that, after the Lord intervened, got him out of the temple before sacrifice was made, chance to witness. Sure was a heavy price for Paul, probably a price he didn't have to pay if he had been a little bit more, you know, hadn't been so stubborn maybe. Let's continue. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. So that means when he went amongst drunks, he didn't get drunk or snuckered. Okay? When he went amongst like cannibals or something, he didn't become a cannibal. Thank you, pardon, brother. That he might gain the cannibals. Okay? And remember what it says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 about how if um, I wrote not to accompany, to accompany yourselves with adulterers and fornicators, yet uh, but not of the ones that are of the world, but if any man who is a brother be an adulterer or fornicator, that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I just butchered that. Go look that up on your own time, okay? See, we're going, we're going to be out amongst the lost. And if the Lord call you to, you go where he call you to, to be a witness unto him. Verse 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. So see, I believe that Paul having this mentality, and that he, and what does it say? I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. I believe again, brethren, that the Lord would have, might have had a different way for Paul to get to Rome. And that the Lord warned Paul about going to Jerusalem. And Paul had a pride problem. He struggled with pride. Romans chapter 7, and when he talks about the thorn in his flesh, okay, he went anyway, and then James like, hey, we got these four guys, and everybody must needs come together. Go do this with them to show everyone that you follow the law. And before a sacrifice was made, the Lord intervenes, Paul gets all beat up, brings him out of there, and because of that, Paul gets a wonderful chance to witness onto the multitude. So, Paul didn't compromise, but he probably didn't have to do a lot of that in order to get to Rome. But see, the Lord used it. The Lord used it. Oh, did he use it? Okay. Yeah. Paul never compromised the gospel. Never once. Should he have gone into that temple to show everyone that he followed the law? The question you ask is, well, what did the Lord think? Got him out of there. 
before the seven days were ended, when a sacrifice was uh, to be offered, because the Lord Jesus Christ already offered himself. You see? So, brethren, we might think something is a good idea, and it will turn out to be very painful for us. <laughs> like me moving to this apartment. Which my, uh, my blessed wife, she's really struggling with right now. And we're now four days away. We still got a lot to do. But um, we could think something might be a good idea and be ready to do it. But. It might not necessarily be the way that the Lord will choose. But as we have seen, the Lord can use any circumstance to bring glory unto himself. That's the point. So, anyway. That's it for this video. Um, like I said, um, we're like, uh, what is it? Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Today is Wednesday, isn't it? Yeah. Wednesday, well, Wednesday's done here. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We got four days. We still got a lot of stuff to do. Uh, so please keep us in uh, your prayers, brethren, as we pray for all of you, all of you, your, uh, that the Lord's will be done in your lives. And brethren, I share with you, uh, my wife is really struggling um, with moving. She was nested. And um, please say a prayer, especially for my wife, Susan, your sister. And we love you. I love you. Thank you so much for watching. If you do, um, I doubt I'll be doing another video until we're out of here and like I said once we're out of here it's going to be a while until we get internet again so um, I might uh, lose contact with a few of you for a little while but we'll see I do have uh, other uh, once we get over there and kind of situated then videos are going to come quite uh, out quite readily uh, still trying to find work you know Nobody has paper applications anymore. They're all online and not having a vehicle myself. I can't drive anywhere. Yada, yada, yada. Oh, fun, 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 fun. But thou, Lord. But thou, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, anyway. Thank you, brethren. I love you. And we will see you whenever we will see you. Bye-bye.